But there's, there's so many cultural things that go on here that I, I, you shouldn't take that for granted. It's really, really kind of wonderful. So congratulations, I hope. Um, this talk is going to be decidedly non-academic in nature. I am a composer, um, and I'm going to talk about my work with my ensemble, because uh, it's really the only thing I'm qualified to talk about. Uh, but through that, we'll also take a look at some issues that have come up in terms of something that likes to get talked about a lot in, in academic circles, which is Armenian identity. You know, what is it mean to be an Armenian, and especially Armenian culture, and specifically for me, Armenian musical culture. You know, in doing what I did with the ensemble, it's a question that came up a lot. Like, is this Armenian music? What makes Armenian music Armenian music? Is it Armenian music just because I wrote it and I'm an Armenian guy? Or is it Armenian does it, because it draws on certain things? Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of, of those sorts of things, but all through uh, the lens of my work with the ensemble. Um, I think maybe we should just, uh, and I, I've only planned this kind of loosely, but has anybody, I know you haven't heard the Nagash Ensemble live, because we only perform in, in Europe and Yerevan, although we are coming to America in October of 2020, which is a year and a half from now. Um, but. Maybe I'll just play a little excerpt of, of the ensemble so you get some orientation as to what we do. Uh, I realized when I was looking for excerpts to play, I have to apologize. They're all kind of live video excerpts, and whenever there's any video, my agent grabs it and kind of puts uh, titles on it and press quotes and all this stuff. It's a little garish sometimes. She has to do that to kind of promote stuff. So. Forgive this stuff, but we're gonna, uh, it'll at least give you a sense of what we do. Uh, I think I'll play you a recent gig, uh, which I think was in Belgium. So that is the ensemble. Uh, everybody's a Yerevan, see, except for me. I'm the only diasporan uh, Armenian. And these guys are actually really s some of the best players and singers in, in Armenia. I'll talk a little bit about how it all came together. Uh, but first, let's hear something we did. Thank you. 
think it goes on a little bit. Um, so before I dive into this, I, I want to find out who I'm talking to. Uh, how many, I assume you're all Armenian. Okay, I thought so. So am I. Uh, and how many of you were born here in the States? Wow, not that many of you. That's fantastic. Wow. And how many of you were then born in Armenia? Again, not that many of you. So you're all from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Wherever elsewhere is. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Okay. It never fails to boggle my mind that Armenians are just from everywhere. And it's, a, it's an amazing story. But Boy, there are only two or three of you that were born here, and, and only two or three that were born in Armenia. That's, that's amazing. Anyway, uh, I normally, when we perform, always when we perform, we're performing for non-Armenian audiences in Europe. I mean, we don't really, well, a couple times we've done things with the Armenian community in Leipzig and, and one time in, in Hamburg, but mostly, it's you know a, a typical performing arts series that we're part of. Usually a classical music type of thing that's willing to divine, uh, you know, talk about classical music in a, in a broader term that'll have us. Sometimes we play world music festivals, although I don't really know what they mean by world music. Uh, it doesn't come from the moon, it's, but that's a, a term they come up with whenever music comes from somewhere else, and I think they don't know what else to call it. Um, but we don't usually play for Armenian audiences. And whenever I've been asked to talk about the ensemble or talk about anything musically, again, it's not for an Armenian audience. And that's great because I love being able to talk about Armenian stuff to non-Armenians because we have these killer secret weapons, you know? If you talk to non-Armenians and you, you're going to talk about music, you talk about Komitas at some point. You know, and you and you play anything, but you play like Garone for somebody who's never heard that before. It's amazing. I mean, it's like everyone just goes, "My God!" And they start googling Komitas right away. And it's, just to see them respond to this stuff, or like my Dudu player. I happen to be blessed with who I think is like the greatest living Dudu player. Just for them to hear Dudu for the first time, it. it People's concepts of Armenian culture, I mean, I'm sure you know this, is very strange. I mean, first you have to make it clear you're not talking about Albania. <laughs> Once they get that clear, then they go, oh, yeah, it's like uh, Kardashians, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. And, and then they go, oh, yeah, that genocide, that sounded bad, right? That, yeah, that was bad. And then it's like maybe a little bit about yogurt or backgammon, but it's just they know very, very little. And it's so wonderful to be able to kind of, it's one of the joys of what I do, is introducing aspects of Armenian culture to, to people who don't know much about it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my background very quickly. I am obviously a, I was born in America, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, Armenian family, uh, a grandson of a genocide survivor from Karport, who had a very, uh, all too typical story. Had a family there, two daughter, two sons and a daughter, who two sons and her husband were killed. She was forced into the march to the desert in Syria. It's a story we've all heard many, many times. But then she uh, was, uh, a man took her out of a camp in Syria, brought her to Paris, then brought her to America. I'll make the story very quick. I think he wanted to marry her. She said, no, I'm actually not going to marry you. Ended up marrying somebody else in America and gave birth to my father and, and two other siblings. Started a whole new family in America. So, again, it's an amazing story um, and a very common one. It's another thing that never fails to amaze me when you hear these stories about split-second decisions that, that people made at that time about whether to stay or go or trust somebody or not trust somebody, and, and next thing you know, there's a whole dynasty in, in Paris or London or Beirut or... Anyway, these are all things we, we know. But talking to people who don't know about that stuff is just mind-boggling. Um, I 
grew up in a very Armenian household. My parents spoke Armenian to each other, but only when they didn't want us to know what they were saying, because I still don't speak very good Armenian. Uh, but all their friends were Armenian, their social circle was Armenian, the church, the weddings, the funerals, all the music in the house. I think my father only had Armenian music, maybe one or two Sinatra records or something, but it was very Armenian. But I didn't necessarily think of myself. I, I mean, I love the music, love the food, love the dancing, love the culture, was always proud to be an Armenian, but I didn't necessarily um, identify as Armenian in the way many people do. Even in the way my sisters did, for example. I was never a member of AYF. I didn't go to the Armenian Olympics, even though my parents met at the Armenian Olympics. Uh, I didn't identify as much with that. And to be honest, I think it was because when I was young, I don't know that I, I, I think I didn't think it was cool or something. And I, I feel funny admitting that to you, but I'm gonna tell you that. And then later on when I, I was a, you know, studying classical music and, and very caught up in you know, Bach or Stravinsky or whatever I was obsessed with at the time, again, I didn't, I thought that was the stuff. I thought that was the important stuff. That's what I was caught up on. You know, I wasn't as identified with Armenian culture. So I think my experience is very extreme because now, as an adult, I've, I've lived off and on in Yerevan the last 15 years, and I work with a totally un Armenian ensemble. I've since come to see how ridiculously foolish I was, but I think because growing up as a diasporan, I didn't get to see a lot of the things at the source that I did when I finally got to Yerevan. I'll tell you very quickly how I got to Yerevan. I was uh, living in New York. I was scoring a lot of films. I've always been a composer. It's the only thing I've ever done. It's not an easy thing to do, to make a living as a composer. Remember that. Um, but I, I was, uh, for about 15 years, scoring films a lot, a lot of documentaries. I did over 300 documentaries in like a 12-year period. It's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but was fairly successful doing that. And I got a call one time from a guy named Narek Hartunian. How many people know who Narek is? Some people do, okay. He's a wonderful guy, a very, very charismatic guy, very passionate guy, very passionate Armenian, very patriotic Armenian. He called me out of the blue because he heard some of my music on the radio or television or something. He said, oh, you know, I'd really like to meet you for dinner, blah, blah, blah. So I agreed to meet him. Um, and I remember I almost didn't meet him. I was kind of going to blow it off. But I happened to be at a, at a recording studio that was just like four blocks from where we were supposed to meet. So I ended up going to this dinner with him. And after a nice dinner and a glass or two or maybe a bottle or two of wine and him talking about Armenia in this very, very passionate way, it was lovely. And he starts showing me these projects that he's doing with Nadegasi Art Institute. These books, they just produced this uh, recording of uh, Komitas piano music, and the, the recording had a book with all the scores and all this stuff, and it was like, I hadn't seen this stuff before, it was just great. So he said, yeah, so you should come to Armenia. It's like, yeah, I should sometime, that's great. Yeah, okay, how about in two weeks? It's like, no, not yet, I can't, I, I'm not gonna do that, it's ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. I go home to my wife, I'm telling her about this guy, this very passionate, crazy guy, and he said, he wants us to come in two weeks. You know, so she said, yeah, why don't we? <laughs> then, another thing happened, the very next day, a project that I was working on, this happens all the time in film and in television, uh, schedule shift, everything's urgent, it's gonna air tonight, oh no, it's not gonna air till next month, blah, blah, blah. This period of time opened up, I went to Armenia, for the first time. This is in 2005. Uh, what's interesting is I went the, the, I think it was April 19th, 2005. Now this is like five days before the 90th uh, commemoration, the genocide. There was a lot going on, a lot going on in Yerevan. I mean, even more, I was also there for the 100th, but there were like all sorts of conferences, all sorts of stuff. Um, and most of you have been to Yerevan, or who, who has not been to Yerevan? Raise your hand if you've never been to Yerevan. <laughs> so you've all been to Yerevan, except for this poor gentleman over here. <laughs> well, as a, as a diasporan 
Armenian, as somebody who's never been there and who did not necessarily identify, I was, I guess, more American Armenian than Armenian American. When I went there, it was mind boggling. I mean, obviously, I really drank the Kool Aid because I, I lived there for 15 years now, but it's little things. It's very, um, I mean, it's a very common story now to go over there, and young people are going there all the time through Birthright and all these other organizations, and it's great how they fall in love with it. But it's the weird little things that happen. I remember one of the things that happened to me, it's the funniest story. I had an uncle named Adi, Adik. We called him Uncle Adi. And if you were in Philadelphia, anybody from Philadelphia by chance? Okay. Well, you're really the same guy who been. <laughs> if you were in Philadelphia in the 60s or the 70s, you knew Adi Kazanjan because he was a bigger than life figure. He did so much for the Armenian community, always organizing dances and, and a boy, an Armenian Boy Scout troop. And at one point he was taking like up to 200 kids skiing every week, 200 Armenian kids. He did so much. He was a wonderful guy. I really love the guy. And he's a real good looking guy too. You know, good-looking Armenian guy, dark-skinned, you know, a bit of a nose. I mean, a good-looking Armenian guy. And so I, I go to Yerevan, it's at night. I wake up early in the morning before my wife, and I was there with my son, who was only nine months at the time. I go out to Yerevan for the first time, walking around. Everybody looks like Uncle Lottie. I mean, honestly, it was, it's just little things like that that, that, that really... Um, it resonates some weird sort of way. It, it, anyway, one of the first things I did there was I went to Nadagasi Art Institute. Uh, how many people have been there to Nadagasi Art Institute? It's a great little, you know, it's a little, uh, they have like classical music recitals and show films and lectures and all this stuff. I saw all the stuff that Nadek was doing there and I was really completely knocked out. Actually, the day I was there, they were doing a, a bunch of children's artwork to commemorate the genocide, just all these wonderful things they were doing. I said, you know, not a, this is great. Like, what do you do for composers? You know, like for young composers, what are they doing? Like, no, that's why you're here. Anyway, I, to make a very long story short, I got very caught up in, in what he was doing through his passion and started doing some work there myself. Um, I organized a competition for young composers. Uh, it was kind of interesting because it was in all these different categories. It was like new classical music, but also songwriters, electronic music, film scoring, which wasn't done that much. And it was great because we got a uh, Yerevan judge and a diaspora and Armenian judge, and then somebody who was completely not connected to Armenia to be a judge. What was interesting about that is like, I think all the music competitions, like just about everything else that happened at that time, it was always assumed that it was rigged. They always knew who was going to win before it happened. And this was, they talked about, oh, you're running a very clean competition. That's amazing. They were just amazed by that. And but what was great uh, for me is that I was able to meet all these wonderful people. Uh, you know, uh, I worked a lot with Tigran Mansourian, Vashe Sharapyan, uh, Rupin Hakverdian was a judge, Armin Husnitz, I, I, I assume these are people most of you know, most of these names. It was really wonderful. I ended up um, with not like, building a recording studio there, teaching regularly, uh, doing all this stuff. And I was doing it because I wanted to, but also it was really completing my education in a major way. I mean, grow up in, growing up in Philadelphia, I knew what a duduk was, but I had never been to a duduk recital. You know, within my first week of being in Yerevan, I think I went to two or three different, like, major duduk recitals. Or hearing Kamansha live for the first time, or a kanum. All this stuff, to me, as a diasporan from America, hearing this stuff at the source was mind-blowing for me. As a composer, you know, I've been a musician all my life. One other thing that was really transformative for me, and it sounds like a, a silly thing, but I always have a, a practice that I do in the morning. I like to do something, some people exercise or meditate or something. I always have a, a musical practice of some sort. Past four or five years, I like to play Bach at the keyboard. I've always been a Bach freak, so 
10 or 15 minutes every morning, I play Bach. And for that 10 or 15 minutes, everything is good. You know, everything is, uh, there's a reason to keep going. There's good in the world. You can kind of get yourself out of the 24-hour news circle, you know, out of the craziness, and you kind of reorient yourself. It's a great way to start my day. At the time, when I was first in Yerevan, well, I'll back up a little bit, because you all know who Komitas is. You all know what he did uh, with transcribing folk songs and his body of work with uh, what he created, uh, you know, the, the songs and the string quartets and the batarak and all this amazing stuff. And I don't know if you've seen them, but, you know, they had that 15 or 16 volume set of everything of his collected. You know, all the folk songs, like three or four of the books are just folk song transcriptions, and then there's a choral work, and all these books, these big green books, and you could get them on Vernissage at that time for like four dollars. It was, it was amazing. It was like heaven, so I bought them all. And, and what I started doing was, especially with the folk song transcriptions, I would open them up randomly and pick a song and, and sight sing it, you know, just get it in my ear, then I'd play it at the keyboard, and then I, you know, I'm a composer, so I have to mess around with it. So I start just messing around with it. And it's, you know, a monophonic song, it's just a single line transcription. So I harmonize it and play with it. And, and without even being conscious of it, I think I was kind of uh, just filling in a lot of gaps in my, my experience of a broader range of Armenian. So it was a really, really wonderful time for me. I uh, was doing so much there that I, we eventually moved there. Uh, first went there, I guess, in 2005. In 2008, we moved there. Um, and one of the things I loved to do in Armenia was to get out of Yerevan. So every, not every weekend, but most weekends, we'd rent a car and just go driving like through Lori or just to any one of the monasteries or we'd go out to Kalaba or, or I just love being in the countryside. And of course, Garni Temple is a, a destination. It's very close to Yerevan. And one day, I was, a friend of mine who had never seen it wanted to see Garni Temple, so I took her out there because she wanted to take pictures, and we went out very early, and uh, there was nobody around, and we're just kind of walking around uh, Garni Temple. And, uh, you, how many people have been to Garni Temple? Probably most of you, right? Well, I heard, and you might have heard it too at some point, out of nowhere, I thought nobody was there, I suddenly heard the most amazing sound I had ever heard. I heard this vocal music that was unlike anything. It was the most beautiful sound. This voice in this temple, it turns out she was singing medieval Armenian spiritual music, and it was Hasmik Bagdasarian who was singing, the woman who was in the ensemble. At that time, I didn't know who she was. I just thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard. And it's like a light switch went off in me, or on in me. It became like, I don't, it like instantly became part of my musical DNA somehow. I, I wanted to steal it, you know? I wanted to make that sound mine. Actually, Stravinsky has a great quote about composers. He says, bad composers borrow. Good composers steal. No, it's a very interesting quote when you think about it, because when you think about borrowing something. If I, if I borrow your coat and put it on, it's like, oh, I can wear this, but then I have to give it back. It's not really mine. You know, I just use it. Uh, I can, you know. But when you steal it, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. So this idea of stealing something and then doing what I wanted with it, I just kept thinking about this sound. And I, I really wanted to work with this sound, but I'm not going to write 15th century Armenian medieval spiritual music because that's not who I am. I mean, I, again, I grew up in America, studied a lot of classical music, um, studied, you know, played a lot of jazz, was always an improviser, but also, again, growing up in Philadelphia, you're hearing a lot of Motown and just American popular music and all that. So this sound that I was hearing I knew I wanted to combine with all these other things. I didn't know what the heck I was doing, to be honest.
But I started telling Hazmik, who I met for the first time that day when I heard her sing, I said, I'm going to write something for you, and it's going to be this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to go on tour, and it's going to be, you know, and she just started like backing away. I mean, I, she just, I think she probably thought I was crazy. But four or five years later, I went back to her with a body of work that I had created. And when you're writing for voice, first thing you have to do is figure out what you're going to say, what the texts are going to be. And that was really tricky, because I had this, this beautiful sound, and I'd been thinking of the kind of energy I wanted to bring to it, but what were the texts going to be? You know, what were the words going to be? I started reading everything, or everything that had been translated, because my Armenian is, is very bad. And then I started asking people to read things for me that I couldn't read, and talked to a lot of literature people, a lot of poets, like, you know, what should I, because telling them of the kind of thing I wanted to do, and they all said, Nadagatsi, you should read Nadagatsi, you want to do Nadagatsi, said Nadagatsi, Book of Lamentations. And I had read some of the Book of Lamentations, but as I read a lot of the Book of Lamentations, and it's great, it's beautiful, it's very profound, but it wasn't it. So I just kept, it literally took, I think, three or four years before I finally stumbled upon, you know, the heritage of Armenian literature, have you ever seen those books? Each one's about like this big. There's a, there's a three volume set of the heritage of Armenian literature. And in the middle of volume two, is a tiny fragment by a virtually unknown medieval Armenian poet and priest named Mogadish Nagash. And he wrote, uh, well, I'll tell you a little story about him and, and what he wrote about. He was a very highly regarded priest in uh, Deir Bekar, had a huge following there in the early 1500s, late 1400s. But of course, it was all Ottoman ruled. It was Muslim ruled. There were many Christians, many Armenians, there were many Jews. It was actually a very cosmopolitan area, and he had a big following and got along very well with all the local authorities. But he built a church for his ever growing following. It ended up, his church had a steeple that was higher than any of the local mosques. This is a true story, because it's kind of all we know about it. That did not sit very well with the Muslim authorities. He was told to take it down. He refused to take it down. He was told again, less politely, to take it down. He still refused. Basically, was uh, forced to leave. Was forced to uh, live the rest of his life in exile, basically. And all he left behind, actually there are a couple of paintings he did, which is hence the name Nagash. He was also a painter. but. All he left behind, besides these paintings, were these 15 poems, most of which deal with the hardship of living a life in exile, something that I think almost all Armenians can relate to. Uh, and these texts were beautiful. They were perfect. They were a godsend. Not only did they have a great meaning, like everything really resonated with me, but they were perfectly rhyming quatrains, you know? The musicality of the language was incredible. I found out later that he was dealing with an orally transmitted tradition, so that all the, all the poems were actually either recited or even sung in his time, although we have no idea what that music sounded like. So there was an amazing musicality to the words already. And plus, they were written in Middle Armenian. It wasn't Grapar, but it wasn't Eastern or Western Armenian. So it was a very kind of Foreign, I mean, I was used to hearing Armenian, but I, a lot of these words were, even now, when I show them to my ensemble, they don't know what certain words are. I've, I've had all 15 poems translated. Uh, I ended up setting all 15 of them. It's actually, I'm still working on it. I'm now setting the very, very last one uh, for our, our third recording. Uh, so these, these words were really a godsend. I uh, brought this work to Hazmik. That I'm back, you know, I'm here again. I told you I was going to do this. And fortunately, uh, she really took to the music and really loved it and became a real champion of it. We put together this ensemble to record it. Uh, again, I got very, very lucky. I was getting very, very good advice from people as to who to use. And uh, 
Everybody we ended up using for that first recording uh, is still in the ensemble. So the ensemble ended up being, uh, as you saw, uh, um, three singers, because again, this vocal thing, I, I knew it was going to be a lot of vocal stuff, and I was hearing a lot of counterpoint. A lot of, again, I was obsessed with like medieval polyphonic vocal music for a period of my life, and I think that plays a role in, in this music as well. So the three singers, and uh, Duduk, and Oud, and Dole, and string orchestra, for some reason, on, on the first recording, anyway. Um, actually, let me play a little sketch of uh, that first uh, recording. This was actually the very first thing I wrote for Hosmian. Hold on a second. Yeah, this is the very, very first, uh, first bit of music. This wasn't even on the final recording. Um. Living in Yerevan had stopped. I hadn't scored films in three or four years. I was making a living as a touring musician. I have another ensemble with my wife, who's also a phenomenal singer. We tour a lot of something called Epiphany Project. Again, not in America, only in Europe. We did okay there. But so that was what I did. I didn't know how to do anything else. So I was like, all right, now that I'm working with this Nagash ensemble, we have to tour, because I don't know what else to do with myself. Um, and that's really tricky business, uh, getting uh, eight people, well, seven musicians and a tour manager around in Europe uh, trying to do this. Trust me, it's really hard. Uh, and it brought up many issues of like, well, what is this music? I have to, you have to kind of define it. You have to, you know, is it, it's not traditional Armenian music. It's kind of classical, sort of, because I'm sort of a classical composer and most everything is notated. But, and also for personal reasons, I started looking at like, well, well, you know, what, what is this? I, what, and how is it Armenian? Is it, now again, there are technical things about it. When you look at it, it, there are aspects of it that you can say, okay, this is why it kind of sounds Armenian. I mean, I write just purely intuitively. I never think of like, I'm gonna make this sound Armenian, I'm gonna make it sound medieval, I'm gonna make it sound like anything. It just, I just do whatever uh, the text basically tell me to do. Um, but there are aspects of it that, you know, a lot of Armenian music tends to be modal as opposed to tonal. Uh, a 
lot tends to be in asymmetrical time signatures as opposed to 3-4 or 4-4. Four, four. So there are things that kind of made it sound Armenian. And again, most of the music I heard growing up was Armenian, so that's what was kind of filtering through. But there still was this kind of identity issue. Now, I was very gratified because the ensemble was really cheering me on. I mean, they, they love playing this stuff, and these guys are amazing because they're all really, really, you know, profoundly knowledgeable about Armenian folk music and Armenian spiritual music, much more than I am. But they've also all been trained at the conservatory. So they can, they can play anything I put in front of them. They can read anything. But it's really a gift to work with these people. And each one of them really brings something unique to the ensemble. But again, it was always this question of like, well, what is this stuff? And um, I think I mentioned, you know who Tigran Mansourian is? Does everybody know who Tigran Mansourian is? OK. Well, he's highly esteemed. He's a great composer, great human being, very dignified, probably Armenia's greatest living composer. He just turned 80 recently. When I first went to Yerevan, he was one of the first people I, I wanted to meet with. He was extremely generous with his time with me, and he's just a lovely, lovely guy. And very early on, I had given him, uh, I think it was that recording, or maybe something else, just sketch recordings. I had given it to him. And I got a call from his assistant two days later, because he doesn't speak very much Armenian. So his assistant calls, and he says, uh, Oh, Mr. Mansour, I would like to meet with you. It's like, uh oh. I, 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 for some reason, I just, I just thought I was in trouble. <laughs> I thought, yeah, wow, well, why is he wanting me? I must. I, he's gonna tell me something bad. He's, it's like, why do you do this? Why do you come here and take our musicians? And what makes you, you know, what makes? <laughs> that's not the type of guy he is. But that's what was going through my mind. <laughs> and I remember this really clearly. We met at. Uh, Parisian Cafe on Abovian, and he's such a lovely guy. I remember, he, he bought a cake for my son, who was now, I think, two or three. We were feeding him nothing but like organic fruits and vegetables that we prepare, prepared ourselves, but here's a big, gross Armenian cake. Yes. So my son loves Tigran, I'm sorry. Um, but I remember he, he had the disc with him, the, and he was gonna give, I, he thought he was supposed to give it back to me, but he, he held it, and he put his arm on my shoulder, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, this is the sound of ancient Cilicia, reinvented for the 21st century. And I went, wow, thank, thank you. I mean, it was really, I mean, we still use that as kind of like a marketing quote. But at the time, it really meant a lot, and I, and I think he was really sincere. Um, because he's not, he's not a bullshitter at all. I mean, he really, it, it just meant a lot for him to say that. Because I, I just felt like after that, you know what? If I'm cool with him, I'm cool. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I, I, it was just a really kind of a, a feeling of confirmation. So we started touring with this stuff. It was very complicated because, uh, again, it had been written for a string orchestra. The very first record was string orchestra and the ensemble. I, had a, uh, I turned all the string parts into piano parts because we couldn't tour with the whole string section. I thought I was making a horrible compromise by making everything just piano instead of strings, but it actually ended up being a blessing in disguise. The piano's a very percussive instrument it did two things. It gave the music a little more lift and a little more rhythm, but it also kind of put me in the driver's seat. I was now actually part of the ensemble, and I could kind of steer it a little bit, and, and it really ended up being a gift. Although, years after we had started touring with the stuff, I went back and looked at some of the original string parts, and I thought, wow, there's a lot that we're still not doing. And uh, about three or four years ago, I created a new version of the music which incorporates a string orchestra. So it's like a string orchestra and the ensemble. And we've actually been touring with that configuration. Uh, we did the program for the first time a couple of years ago in Yerevan, and now actually this summer we're doing it with South Czech Philharmonic and Orchestra de Strasbourg. So, you know, decent. Not Berlin Philharmonic, not New York Philharmonic, but like good mid-sized European orchestras. Actually, let me show you a little bit of the orchestra thing.
continue. Uh, uh, you'll come in October when we play here. It's that's the I gotta tell you, it really kills me to, to watch these videos. I feel very uncomfortable because you know, we live in this YouTube culture and everything we get is through recordings and videos, and yet it is not like being in the room with it. Yeah. It changes by a huge, huge, huge factor. I've been a performing musician all my life. Uh, I've played in lots of different ensembles, some good, some bad. But on a good night with these guys, there's been no more ecstatic moments in my life. Than when, when we're on, actually when we're off, we're still pretty good. But, but when we're on, we're really, it's, it's a really exciting ensemble. Uh, I'm amazingly proud of them because they each one of them brings something really, really unique to it. I think my Duda player really is the most amazing Duda player living in Yerevan right now. My Uda player is crazy. I write things for him. I'll say, Adam, you know, I know you won't really be able to play this because it's, it's not playable, it's too hard, but something like this. I want to do something like this. And he goes, okay, and I'll take it home. And the next day, it's like, Boom! you know, he, he can do it. He can do just about anything. And then my Dole player, I mean, I love this guy. He's just like a rhythmic genius. He, um, you know, he, he looks like he's reading all the time. And I do write stuff out for him, but he doesn't play that at all. He play what he comes up with is so much better than, than whatever I would come up for him. So I'm really, really blessed to have them. And then Hasmik's voice is amazing. Uh, the tall woman, I have to tell you, one of your speak the the other side of the speaker is out. So we're actually missing big chunks of things. So we're not hearing a lot of the voices, unfortunately. Uh, and the tall woman is not an alto, she's a contralto. She sings really, really, really low. In fact, I'm working on a new record now, and uh, a couple weeks ago I was mixing this thing that we had done, and I realized I told her to sing it an octave lower than I had originally written. Actually, let me just play that, because I think I have it. Um, it's just a short thing. It's just part of a part of a piece. Actually, the main part of the piece we're not even hearing. I just put this on a separate file. Listen to her voice. I hope she's coming out of the right speaker. One of these players, I think, really brings something unique to the ensemble. And I'm really, really lucky to have them. They've been the same musicians ever since we started it. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's funny, when you go to Armenia for the first time, there is such an amazing sense of history. That that's the other thing that was really eye-opening for me personally. Growing up in America, something's 200 years old, and it's like, wow. Really, that's that's real history, you know. And then then you go to Europe and you see castles that were built in the 1500s. It's like, wow, that's really old. But you know, you go to Yerevan and it's like, well, this is from 9000 BC, and you know the Urartians were here. It's like, a, that's deep. I mean, that's it's a whole different sense of things. And Armenians also have a very 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 uh, proud sense of their culture as well as they should, you know. A, because their culture is amazing. When you have traditions like literary traditions of like Frick and Nadagatsi and Chavins and, and musical traditions of uh, Sayat Nova and Mashtots and Komitas, I mean, and when everything else you have has been taken from you, you cling to your tradition, your cultural tradition. So everything's tradition, tradition, tradition. That's good and bad. It's bad because a lot of the, and here I'm gonna say things that are probably gonna get me in trouble, but I'm just gonna say them anyway. A lot of the state ensembles, like the state, officially sponsored state, this ensemble, whatever, they're doing the same stuff in the same way that they've been doing for like 30, 40, 50 years. And they're all tired of it, you can see it. And the people just play in there because they're getting paid a small amount of money to do it. 
And what's ridiculous about that is because the stuff that they're playing, which is now tradition, almost all of it, when it was created, was not traditional. I mean, that's the thing that, about most art that is really great, is great because it broke with that tradition. Even Komitas. I mean, you talk about Komitas as like the keeper of the flame of Armenian traditional folk music, and, and that's true. But I think Komitas' genius was what he did with these things and fused them with new technologies, basically. Think about it. He took Armenian folk songs, but put them together with these new tuning systems, new instruments. I mean, pianos, string quartets, all this stuff. This was not stuff that was in the regions from where he was getting these folk songs from. His genius was to put this together, filter it through his komitas this, and, and come out with something that's an unbelievably beautiful body of work that is as much tradition as it is something brand new. To me, that is what is interesting about culture. It has to be a living, breathing thing. And in order to do that, <clears throat> it gets back to what I said earlier about borrowing. When you borrow stuff, you put it together. For example, like, there, well, there are lots of examples. But Dvorak, you know Dvorak? I don't like Dvorak. Uh, Austrian composer, came to America in the 1800s, uh, got obsessed with the whole myth of American Indians and the vast west of this and Americana, and he wrote New World Symphony. I don't like New World Symphony. Because to me it's very faux Americana. It's like a fake version of Americana, written by an Austrian guy who has n nothing to do with anything. Art's like like, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, you started hearing like these bad uh, recordings of like monks with disco beats underneath it. That's what it's like when you superficially borrow things and put them together. But what Komitas did is he went deep. You know, he went deep into Armenian folk music, but also deep into Western classical music. You know, don't forget, he was really trained in Berlin, he was really up on all, all, you know, Western tonal theory. So his genius was to create these things. That's what really interests me. But it's got to go deep. There's a lot of stuff going on in Armenia now that is really interesting. Some of it's grim. Some of it's horrible. To be honest, about 98% of all music ever is not very good. I mean, what we know of is just the good stuff that is left behind, you know? I mean, look at any era of music. Look at Haydn and Mozart. Two guys, the official classical period of music, it was a very short period of time, those are the only two guys we still play. I mean, once in a while, some Gluck and some, some other things. But there were so many other composers working then, but there's only those two that, that really remain in our consciousness. Um, I wanted to talk about some other people that I think are doing really interesting work. Again, there's a lot of people doing lots of stuff, but there's certain people that go really, really deep with this stuff, and that's when things start to happen. Because it's weird, when you go deep and you combine things, it just changes the mathematics of everything. You know, you take these two things and one plus one doesn't equal two, it equals 2,000. Because now sparks start to fly and things get, take off. I'm gonna, there's a zillion people I could talk about. No, there's not that many really. But there's, there's a, a bunch of, there's, like in the world of jazz, for example. Great jazz players in Armenia, really great. You know, like Bahagan Harapetyan, do you know who he is? Or Armin Husnitz, you know who I'm talking about? These guys are massively brilliant jazz players, I'd put them up against anybody in the world. Or actually even here in LA. One of the drags about me being here tonight is in New York, oddly enough, is a concert that I would love to see featuring Archam Manukyan and Vardan Osepian. These guys are not good Armenian musicians. They are just good musicians like on a par with like anything in the world. They're phenomenal. 
But the guy I'm thinking about, who again goes very, very deep with this stuff, and forgive me if I'm preaching to the converted, I, I would imagine you already know him and know his work well, but Tigran Hamazian is somebody I'm thinking of, who's done in the world of jazz, you know, jazz using that as a very big umbrella. Do you, you all know who Tigran Hamazian is? Yes. I just think he's wonderful. He's a, a really phenomenal example of somebody who goes very deep into a lot of different things. And he's an interesting guy, because like, he's gone through different periods. And he's talked about like, you know, when he was studying just bebop jazz, it's kind of like when I was studying just classical music, I didn't care about Armenian this or that. He said the same thing. I mean, I, I didn't care about Armenian folk music when I was doing bebop. I only cared about bebop. And he also has a lot of influences from all sorts of things. Heavy metal music, Norwegian folk music. I mean, all, all sorts of things. I'm going to play just a couple clips, and I'm going to jump around. Don't tell him I did this if you know him, because I would hate it if somebody did this to me. But there's one clip I want to play of his that's really long. And it's brilliant, but it's like 20 minutes long. And so I'm just going to jump around in different parts. Actually, first I'm going to play, um, you might have seen this before. Uh, this will show another one of his influences, actually. That was Stairway to Heaven, you know? Um, and it, it's just so amazing, because it says so much about him as a musician. He's about like two or three or something, and every note he plays, even if he has to hesitate a little bit, it's dead on. I mean, he plays the right note. It says so much about him, you know? And also the way he looks in the camera, it says a lot about him, too. I mean, you're not a musician going out and playing in public unless you want people to be looking. Uh, but Tigran is a guy who, again, I just think he's, he's just brilliant. Let me, I want to show you another little clip. Uh, yeah. I'm, and again, I'm going to jump around in this because it's long. Uh, but this is the solo piano thing that just shows a little bit of the range of what this guy does. I think T. Grimm's a genius. I think he's a great, great, great musician. Um, but again, he goes really deep. He goes deep into his knowledge of folk music, his knowledge of heavy metal, his knowledge of Western classical music. And, and you have to, to, to do that. Um, there's a lot of people doing Armenian jazz. Uh, some of it's okay, but a lot of it's 
It's kind of like when you just borrow a sweater. You know, it's not that big a deal. There's this whole ethno-jazz scene in Yerevan. And again, there's a couple bands that are good, but a lot of them are, are just kind of imitating work that like Arto Chungpoyajin. How many of you have seen Armenian Navy Band? I gotta tell you, when I first went to Yerevan, right around 2005, 2006, 2007, Armenian Navy Band was in its prime. And seeing them at Avant Garde Folk Club, how many of you saw them at Avant Garde Folk Club? Transforming experience for me. I mean, again, I, I've always liked jazz, but I like more like, you know, Miles Davis, small ensembles, interesting, Keith Jarrett, people like that that were doing kind of new things with jazz. An Armenian big band? Nah, I don't think so. But this, this was mind-boggling. I mean, with a duduk and, and canon and, and, and this, uh, this brass section playing music that was like, what? I, these guys were just amazing. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, because again, I'm a classical composer. God, somebody should do that, but with a, like a classical ensemble. That's not exactly what I did, but I realized years later, I kind of did do that. I, I took the best, you know, he came to Yerevan from Turkey, just grabbed up the best musicians he could in jazz and put this amazing band together. Uh, there's one other guy I want to talk about who you might not know, uh, I, I, although I think he's been here, not to ARPA, but I, I think he's played in L.A. Do you know Arik Gregorian? Who knows our Arik Gregorian? Oh, good, okay. Uh, Arik is amazing. Um, he's another one of these guys that goes really deep into his thing, whether it's his Armenian thing or his, in his case, I guess I'm kind of focusing on these different fields, like putting me in classical and Tigran in jazz, Arik is basically a rock musician. Uh, he is, used to have a band called the Bambir, you know Bambir? Now this is not Bambir Bambir. The original Bambir was like late 60s, 70s, guys out of Gumri doing like folk rock versions of Armenian folk stuff. And then the Sons, oh, two of them were Sons, they're the original members, starting another band they were very original, but not with their name, because they also called it Bambir. <laughs> it was the Bambir, but this was the, the children of the original Bambir. One of those guys is Arik Gregorian, who has now started his own thing, because Bambir doesn't play so much anymore, called Vishal. How many of you have heard of Vishal? Really? Have you seen Vishal? Uh, Vishal, well, first of all, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a moving target, because every time I see him, it's a different configuration. But I really, really love what this guy is doing. Uh, again, taking Armenian folk stuff, stuff with its roots in Armenian culture, but then doing something really new with it. Let me play you a clip of Arik. Uh, in fact, he just sent this to me. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to skip around. Don't tell him I did this. But the whole thing's like uh, 13 minutes long, and I can't play the whole thing. So I'm just going to jump to different portions of it. So that's him on flute. He also sings.
If you get a chance, there's not that much that's actually been officially recorded. He's doing his first recording now, but, but I think Otto Gregorian's like a major, major guy. And again, I think he does it by, he just goes really deep, both into his roots and into his other sources. And it's not this superficial pairing of like, glossy, temporarily putting things together in some fancy way. Uh, guys like T. Graham, Otto, they're, 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 you know, the real, the real deal. So there's a lot going on in Armenia. Um, there's a lot going on musically. There's a lot of changes that have happened um, just in the time that I've been going there. And I realize I'm a relative newcomer, but uh, we don't have enough time to talk about them. And I, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions and stuff. But there are a lot of things that were not great about, especially with the conservatory, for example, like when I first went there. It was a very Soviet. Have any has anybody gone to the conservatory in Yerevan? Any graduates? Of, you studied? No, you didn't study there. Okay. I mean, thank God there's a conservatory there. It was built by the Soviets, so we should thank them for that. But it was very uh, dominated by Russian culture in a lot of ways, and the attitude. And again, this is just me. This is just my opinion. This is not an empirical truth. Uh, this is just my own feeling about it. It all tends to be a little too mired in an outdated notion of what is avant-garde. You know, it's very kind of old school from the 40s and 50s uh, attitude. You know, whereas there's so much that's happened, like especially in America. I mean, I'm very enamored of a lot of the iconoclastic American composers. Phil Glass, Steve Wright, John Adams. This is the kind of new music that might be played by the Los Angeles Philharmonic, for example. Uh, that stuff has not penetrated into Armenian culture at all. There's not much of an awareness of it. And what little awareness there is, they, they dismiss it. It's very strange. Um, but there are massive, massive changes going on, even at the conservatory. I don't know if you know, but the, they, when the new administration came in a year ago, they, uh, they changed, there was a big changing of the guards at the conservatory. It's now run by a woman, Sona Hovnezian. You know Sona, uh, conductor of uh, Hover Choir. She's great. She's a great conductor. Uh, they've now made Arthur Avanesov. You know Arthur Avanesov, young composer, really brilliant guy, is now running the composition department. So there's lots and lots and lots of changes that this revolution we had a year ago. And that's a whole other story. I was there for that whole thing. It was really one of the most amazing, beautiful, intense things I ever witnessed. Um, but the changes that have come about are not just political and, and uh, economic and whatnot. I mean, they're really changing a lot of things. For good and for bad. I mean, not everybody's happy. They changed the regime at the conservatory. I think that's basically a good thing. Um, some of the changes they're making are, are less than good, but I'm not going to, I'm going to get in trouble if I talk too much about that. So, um, what else? There's, there's a lot of really great things going on. I've tried to introduce a few of them. Uh, I really suggest you look at more of Tigran's work or Adi Gregorian's work. Um, I do want to leave time for a few questions. Uh, Oh, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to play you. We are now working on the third and final volume of Nagash poems. This will be the last of these CDs, because again, he only left 15 poems behind. So I'm now uh, finishing them. And actually, each of them, we put them out with a book. So it has like all the texts and a couple essays about Nagash and the ensemble. Actually, for the new one that's coming out, we got the world's only real Nagash scholar, this guy, Michael Pfeiffer, um, to write uh, the liner notes for it. So we're working on the, the third CD now. This isn't it, this is actually the first CD. Uh, and all the texts are in English and German and French and Armenian for everything. Um, uh, I wanted to play you a little excerpt of uh, the new, do we have time to play one more excerpt and then I'll wrap up. So this is something that I think nobody's really heard, but, um, and we're still working on the recording, but we've been performing it live. 
So this comes from, uh, well, actually, I think one of our most recent gigs from just a couple months ago. This is uh, actually called Lamentations on the Death of Youth. It's, it's the first cut on the, what will be the new CD. It's uh, 30 minutes long. So again, I'm not gonna play the whole thing. I think actually my agent put together excerpts. So this is just gonna be excerpts of this piece, I believe. I wish both speakers were working.
It's been a long night. Uh, thank you. Thanks for letting me talk about all this stuff. Uh, uh, 